it's my pleasure to introduce Dean Lawrence Mitchell of Case Law School, and uh, he will introduce our speaker today. And again, I very much appreciate your putting this together, Michael and Lawrence, and uh, we're ready for you. Thanks. No Thank you, Bruce. Thank all of you for being here. Um, on behalf of our great law school, it's, I'm really proud to welcome you to our annual Cox Center Humanitarian Award Lecture at the City Club of Cleveland. We're very pleased to be co-sponsoring this event with the Greater Cleveland International Lawyers Group. In a city with a legal community as rich as ours, we've pursued a mission of engagement beyond the walls of our law school to share with this community the great work of our faculty and our guests and to provide opportunities for our students to become acquainted with members of the bar in a variety of areas. Today, of course, our focus is on one of the things that we do best, international law. Our endowed Cox Center, under the leadership of the simply remarkable Michael Scharf, celebrates its 20th anniversary this year and has allowed the law school to become and remain a world leader in the field of international law. You know, you live and die by the rankings, but I'm pleased to report that just last week, U.S. News & World Report ranked our international law program in the top 11. Yes, they rank 11, not 10, um, but in the top 11 in the nation. Good work, Michael. From our international war crimes work to our work in international financial fraud, from our Utrecht program to our unique in the U.S. China program, from our engagement with issues of international intellectual property to our study of international organizations, and even to the burgeoning internationalization of our law medicine program, there are few areas of the law in which our law school fails to engage with the world around us. The opportunity to present to you speakers like Ambassador Rapp is one more opportunity, and a very special opportunity, to continue our study and engagement with issues of global importance. This lecture would be special if for no other reason than that it is being delivered by Ambassador Stephen Rapp, United States Ambassador for War Crimes. But there's more. Ambassador Rapp has been selected by our international law faculty to receive the Cox Center Humanitarian Award for Advancing Global Justice. This prestigious award, which has been called Cleveland's Nobel, was established in 2004. Past recipients include Hans Corell, UN Undersecretary General for Legal Affairs, Judge Philippe Kirsch, President of the International Criminal Court, my former colleague, Th Judge Thomas Bergenthal of the International Court of Justice, Luis Mourinho Ocampo, Chief Prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, Robert Petit, Chief Pres Prosecutor of the Cambodia Genocide Tribunal, Navanathan Pillay, UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, and Brenda Hollis, Chief Prosecutor of the Special Court for Sierra Leone. Ambassador Rapp epitomizes the virtues of the humanitarian ward and the virtues it was designed to recognize. He has spent the past decade tirelessly working to bring major war criminals to justice. First as a prosecutor at the Rwanda Tribunal, then as chief prosecutor of the Special Court for Sierra Leone, and now as U.S. Ambassador at Large for War Crimes Issues. Ambassador Rapp's speech today is titled The Reach and Grasp of International Criminal Justice. How do we lengthen the arm of the law? Well, all one needs to do is look at a newspaper pretty much any day of the week and know that this topic could not be more timely nor more important. There have been many weighty issues of international criminal justice in the news in recent days. Who should prosecute the U.S. officer for the killing spree in Afghanistan? Should the Security Council authorize the International Criminal Court to prosecute President Assad of Syria? Why is Sudan's indicted president, Mohammed al-Bashir, still able to travel freely around the globe? And how is an international tribunal likely to rule on April 26 in the trial of former Liberian President Charles Taylor? I know that Professor Scharf will be present for the verdict. Ambassador Rapp has graciously agreed to take questions from the audience at the end of his lecture. At that time, just raise your hand and a microphone will be brought to you. Since this is being webcast live around the world, we'd appreciate if you would state your name and affiliation and briefly ask your question. That is to say, no paragraphs with question marks at the end. 
<clears throat> Let me now call one extraordinary man, Michael Scharf, director of the Cox Center, up to the podium to present another extraordinary man, Ambassador Rapp, with the Cox Center Award for Advancing Humanitarian Justice. Thank you for this. All right, Stephen, if you will join us up here. And the power vested in me as director of the Frederick K. Cox International Law Center, it is my great, great pleasure this year to present our Humanitarian of the Year Award to Ambassador Stephen Rapp. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. There you go. Thank you. Set this. Let's, do I set it? Where do I? Uh, Before you do, I think she needs a quick oh, picture. Okay, a quick picture. Hands, so okay, fantastic. Me lurking in the background. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So, send it here or bring it um, to? Well, just hold it for you. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much, Dean Mitchell and and uh, and Michael and and Case and uh, and the Cox Center. Uh, for international justice and law. Um, this is, a, this is a, a great honor for me, and it's particularly an honor to be receiving it from, uh, from this center because of all that you do to advance international criminal justice in the world today and all you do to train the leaders who will advance it and bring it to greater success in the future. It's brought home to me, I think, every couple of weeks uh, when, I, when I open my, my email and I see a copy of the, uh, of the War Crimes Prosecution Watch, which is put out by the Cox Center together with the Public Interest Legal uh, Law and Policy Group, PILPIG. And uh, just looking at the last issue, I saw that there were uh, 30 countries around the world in which there had been violations past and present uh, in, which the, in which this newsletter was reporting. On, on prosecutable cases. And as Dean Mitchell said, we only have to look at the newspaper, uh, at the developments in, in Syria today where we've had thousands of, of innocent civilians killed by bombardment. But even worse, and, and I was just there on the borders last week, uh, we now have men, women, and children uh, uh, being slaughtered, uh, hacked to death uh, with knives in, in villages around Homs and, and Dara, and the level of atrocities, if, if anything, increasing. Uh, we see developments in, in South Cordovan and Blue Nile, frankly, that don't get in the news other than when George Clooney was arrested last week at the Sudan Embassy, but uh, uh, horrendous atrocities being committed against people in the, in the Nuban Mountains. And uh, we also see, as, as we follow the news of, of international diplomacy, how these issues are, are playing out at, at, at the highest levels. Uh, Many, many of you, I'm sure, saw the news on Saturday of the, the arrest of Abdullah al sanusi the former head of, of Libyan security uh, in Mauritania. And now the question has arisen, will he go to the ICC pursuant to the arrest warrant issued by the ICC last June? Uh, will he go to France, which has tried him in absentia, but under the European Covenant would have to try him again, uh, but for the murder of 170 people in that UT era? UTA air uh, uh, flight that exploded of, over Niger uh, in, in 1989? Uh, does he go to Libya, where he committed atrocities against his own people over the course of, of 30 years? Uh, will American law enforcement have an opportunity to talk to him about Pan Am 103 and, and other acts? Uh, so everywhere we see the reach of international justice, but we also have to confront uh, the doubt about uh, whether it has the grasp uh, to accomplish the goals that it set for itself, the goals of, of having an effective system of justice, of accountability for the worst crimes known to humankind, a system that offers the prospect that victims of these crimes in the past can achieve justice in courts now, and a system that's effective enough to deter those crimes from occurring in the future and preventing other people from being victimized. Certainly in this last 12 months, we've seen examples of where uh, there has been that grasp, uh, where there has been effective results, um, most notably with the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, established uh, now 18 years ago at a time when the world uh, uh, had, I think, relatively low expectations, a feeling that nothing effective had been done in the Balkans, uh, there wasn't the will to send in peacekeepers or civilian protection forces. Uh, but instead, uh, 
uh, the decision was to send in lawyers and judges and, and establish a tribunal and little expectation that it would ever reach people at a high level. Now, after having brought people at the level of Slobodan Milosevic to, to justice in, in 2001, uh, in the last year we've seen the arrest of the last two major fugitives, uh, uh, General Mladic, who was the leader at Srebrenica, the genocide of 8,000 men and boys in 1995, and Goran Hadzic, uh, responsible, by, alleged to be responsible for the, for the killing of, of Croatians at the Vukovar Hospital in, in 1995. 161 people were charged by the ICTY. Every one of those 161 were brought to the bar of justice. Even when I was U.S. Attorney in Northern Iowa, I don't think I ever charged 161 persons uh, or group over a period of time and, and, and had them all brought to court. Uh, at the Rwanda Tribunal, where I worked for six years, we've had indeed 83 of the 92 arrestees brought to, brought to justice, uh, many at a very high level. And though it doesn't gain a lot of attention during this last year, many of the complex, multiple accused cases of the military and the political leaders uh, uh, responsible for the genocide of 800,000 men, women, and children, only 100 days, their trials have, have come to, to a conclusion with, with historic judgments uh, having been rendered. Uh, in Cambodia, I was there on February 2nd, uh, February 3rd, when the judgment uh, against, uh, on appeal against the leader of the, of, uh, of the S-21 torture center where t at least 12,000 people uh, were brought to, to be tortured and, and to confess and eventually to be executed with fewer than a dozen surviving. Uh, the commandant uh, of that center, having gone through trial and now appeal, his case was finally concluded with, with a life sentence and, and a trial is now underway for the three surviving leaders of the Pol Pot regime allegedly responsible for the murder of almost two million men, men and women and children from 1975 to 1999. Dean Mitchell mentioned that the Charles Taylor case has been announced for judgment on the 26th of April. In the Kenya case, uh, uh, in a situation where uh, the court decided not to arrest, issue arrest warrants, six political leaders of, of Kenya, including uh, two uh, who were the leading candidates for the president of Kenya in the, in the coming elections, uh, voluntarily came to court uh, under uh, orders to appear, went through confirmation hearings that resulted in four of them being uh, uh, charges uh, being confirmed. And uh, the, the impact of, of that continues to resonate in Kenya uh, and, and across the region. And finally, of course, just in the last five days, we've had the first judgment by the International Criminal Court in the case of uh, Thomas Labanga. So there has been amazing number of, of, of developments uh, in the world that I think are, are positive, that indicates that this project uh, can achieve success. On the other hand, uh, that case that both the Dean and I mentioned in, in Syria is the one that, uh, that continues to challenge us, where the pro any prospect of achieving justice at the national level uh, seems impossible before that regime were somehow to change. Uh, and the prospect of it being brought to justice at the international level, at the ICC, is, is realistically uh, blocked by the prospect of a Russian veto in the Security Council. And in the ICC itself, we have to recognize that even after a court uh, has been in active existence uh, for eight or nine years, only five individuals have in fact, uh, are in fact under arrest and in detention in the detention facility some nine other living individuals under, under, uh, uh, under public arrest warrants uh, uh, remain uh, on the lam. And also, we have to recognize that this period uh, in which I was involved in, in the Yugoslavia court and the Sierra Leone court, the Sierra Leone court, internationalized courts both, uh, is to a large extent drawing to an end. That the ICTY, the ICTR, the SCSL, uh, are uh, concluding their work, uh, that the 43 judges that have served in those courts uh, uh, won't be serving in the future, uh, and that the sort of quantity of, of decisions and, and action in the area of international law uh, will, will diminish and to a large extent be limited to what's happening at, at the ICC uh, and to such other courts as might be created uh, by agreement uh, uh, at the regional level or uh, hybridized within national systems or in national systems themselves. 
and with the ICC, of which we're not a member, and I'll be glad to answer questions uh, about the U.S. relationship. We recognize that only 120 countries are members of the ICC, 72 are not. Many of the major conflict zones of, of, the, uh, uh, of the world are outside its territorial uh, jurisdiction. And, uh, and even in the cases where there is territorial jurisdiction, the crimes often occur in parts of the country in which the state themselves uh, don't have effective control. And so an institution that's based on state cooperation can find itself effective. And of course, when it comes to the Security Council, its ability to refer other cases, we have one, obviously the difficulty of getting past the veto in, in situations such as Syria, and two, uh, the difficulty of achieving uh, cooperation uh, with states that have not accepted uh, the ICC treaty. And at the national level, of course, which the ICC and all of us, and as American policy, we've always recognized, has the primary responsibility to prosecute these cases. There are questions about capacity uh, in many places in the world which have been through these conflicts, who had difficultly challenged justice systems to begin with, and which may have precipitated the conflict, uh, but have devastated uh, judicial institutions after conflict and simply don't have the capacity uh, to pursue these kinds of cases, and if they do, don't have the will to pursue them except against those that have lost the conflict. So what can we do and to make this effective? But before I get to that question, I, I want to pose the other one, which is, is the system that we have today uh, effective uh, in, in beginning to deter these crimes and having, a, and having an effect? I think all of us know that in any system of criminal justice, the prospect that people will be arrested, uh, the prospect that individuals be, will, be, uh, will be convicted, uh, is, is an uncertain one. And that, uh, but nonetheless, the risk uh, to one's future of, uh, of, of such consequences deter many people uh, from committing the crimes in the first place. And so today we have a situation in the world where the risk have risen. Certainly, if one is within the territory of an ICC, uh, an ICC uh, uh, member state, uh, the consequences uh, uh, could be quite clear. There could be an indictment uh, uh, with your name on it. But even if you're not, the prospect that, uh, that you could find yourself in the dock, I think, is, is now very real and is, is the question in the newspapers uh, within days of the beginnings of the reports of, of atrocities. The possibility that the international community might find the will to refer the case. The fact that, uh, uh, that even if it doesn't refer the case, other mechanisms could be established uh, uh, to bring the individual to, to justice. And we also have the phenomenon of, of states uh, uh, exercising jurisdiction uh, outside uh, the territory of, 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 their, of their courts generally uh, to bring to justice people that uh, might seek a safe haven uh, in, uh, in, in a third country. Uh, we've seen successful prosecutions in Belgium and the Netherlands and in Denmark and Germany, uh, uh, in Canada, uh, and, and even in the United States for conduct con uh, committed elsewhere. Uh, it was mentioned, uh, we both mentioned the, the Charles Taylor case, but I think most, many people here are familiar with the fact that Charles Taylor's son, uh, Charles Taylor Jr., who at 19 joined his father uh, in, in Liberia in 1997 and became head of his anti-terrorism unit and became, according to the evidence, uh, someone who, who enjoyed torturing people to death, uh, made the mistake of flying through Miami, Miami Florida on a false passport in, in, in 2006. And uh, he, he was then arrested and because of the fact that he was a U.S. citizen, having been born when his father was a student in Massachusetts, uh, he was charged. I know it, it takes certain facts in order to, uh, in, in order to make a case, but uh, uh, he was charged and, uh, uh, by indeed the first person uh, charged under the Torture Act of, uh, of, of 1994 uh, and uh, for, for torture of Liberians in Liberia. And after a jury verdict was sentenced to 97 years in prison, uh, a verdict uh, upheld by the 11th uh, Circuit Court of Appeals. And so the danger that uh, in the future you'll face these consequences, I think has become much more real. 
beyond that, and I was recently at a conference with, with President Song of, of the ICC, a great, uh, was a professor of, of law before he was a, uh, elected to the ICC in 2003 and is now, because of the fact he had a three-year term and was never been elected for nine, he's now in his tenth year as a judge of the ICC and was last week re-elected for another three-year term as, as president. Uh, but he was pointing out that it was beyond the sort of, sort of uh, deterrence that one has to look at these institutions and it's often hard to prove uh, individual cases of deterrence. Uh, but he spoke uh, particularly about the ability of the law and of the practice uh, to, uh, uh, to establish norms uh, and, and that, 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 that filter deep within communities. And, and essentially make certain types of acts um, unacceptable. And uh, we've seen that with things in the world like slavery and, 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 and other sorts of crimes that at one time were accepted and then, and, and then became just totally, um, still happen, but uh, uh, beyond the, the pale of, of, of human understanding and acceptance. Uh, noting that, that in terms of doing this, the, the ICC role and this, in the international systems role in, in working with national systems to de develop their own legal response to these, to these crimes in ways that, that, that fit uh, their particular circumstances is key to that. And I know when, when those of us, I'm, I'm just, we, I was involved as a United States attorney for, for eight years in the 1990s when we began to see an enormous uh, fall in the rate of crime in many of our major cities, uh, a decline that has continued. And uh, many people have theorized on that, but I have put it down largely to a situation where, where law enforcement, uh, having been alienated from communities, began to work much more closely uh, with the communities themselves and, and in their interest, uh, community policing and, and, uh, and an approach to, to law that wasn't uh, completely punitive, but, a, but an approach to law that also recognized that it was often the high crime uh, areas, often uh, poor areas, often minority areas that were suffering the greatest from the crime. That if people were enlisted uh, in their own interest uh, against, these, uh, against the scourge, that, uh, that one would reduce that crime and indeed make the idea that a person would commit those acts unacceptable no matter where they came from. And, and, Perhaps that's some of what we've seen in, in the United States, but I think it's some of which uh, it may be aspirational, but something that I think we can hope for uh, at, at the international level. But those are, those are the things about what, uh, uh, what, what's there today. What I'd like to talk about is what can be done to, uh, to lengthen that, that arm of international justice and, and where the, the real prospects lie. Uh, one thing that's excited me in the last uh, few weeks and excited me even about American political system, which, which many people think is, uh, and, and we see many aspects of its, of its dysfunction, uh, but we recently uh, presented legislation in Congress to, to expand the Rewards for Justice program. I mean, this may seem like a, after talking about these high-minded things, this is getting rather particular and, and, and realistic, but, but uh, we have a Rewards for Justice system uh, that pays in cases of transnational organized crime and, and terror. I administer a, a system for rewards of justice for war crimes, and it applies under our law at the moment only to fugitives from the Yugoslavia, Rwanda, and Sierra Leone courts. Of course, there are not very many of those uh, anymore. Uh, but during the last two and a half years since I've been in this job, because I went back and looked at, at several cases that had developed uh, over the course of a couple, three years before I was there, I've paid out some 14 rewards uh, for information that led to the arrest of certain key fugitives at the Yugoslavia and Rwanda tribunals, uh, and have spent a lot of effort, in the case of the Rwanda tribunal, publicizing the availability of those rewards uh, in, in the countries in which we think those last nine fugitives are, are hiding. Uh, the system as it stands now pays up to $5 million for the, the greatest risk and the, and the most valuable criminal. We, we make an evaluation in each case. Uh, the largest reward I've paid to date is, is some $2 million. Uh, the, uh, it doesn't apply, however, in ICC cases or in the case of other courts. We presented legislation that would essentially eliminate that restriction. It says basically that uh, it, we could pay 
uh, for any individual charge of genocide, war crimes, or crimes against humanity at any international or hybrid or mixed court, provided the Secretary of State made a determination that this was, was appropriate. And this specifically would allow a, a reward to be paid for, for, uh, uh, for Joseph Coney of the Lord's Resistance Army and his uh, two the two commanders that are still alive, he killed the other two that were on the ICC arrest warrant. And um, as well, uh, other cases, uh, even then Omar al-Bashir for that, for that matter. And uh, the program has been recently expanded to pay rewards up to $25 million. And uh, interestingly, uh, and in part because of, I think, the passion, uh, and this was even before the, the video that went viral uh, in, the last, uh, in the last 10 days, the passion in Congress on a bipartisan basis for bringing Joseph Coney to justice is we've picked up enormous bipartisan support from Burton of Indiana, of Helms Burton fame, to Berman of California on the other side of the aisle, to, to Eliana Ross Lightning, the Cuban American Congresswoman who chairs the, the, the House of Foreign Relations and Foreign Affairs Committee. They're now sponsors of this legislation. And I think we're looking at the prospect uh, that before the end of the year, this will become law. And we will be able to put out the posters for Joseph Coney and the CAR and, and uh, South Sudan and, and the DRC and, uh, and uh, get the information uh, that we can use within the operation, which everyone also knows that has been deployed of advisors that are working with, uh, with law enforcement and, and military forces in those countries and, and bring Joseph Coney uh, to, to justice. There are, um, of course, other things that all of these cases involve. Uh, in the Charles Taylor case, um, we didn't have, for the Special Court for Sierra Leone, uh, Chapter 7 powers. We didn't have the right to call up a state like the uh, ICTY can and say it's mandatory you, on you as a matter of international law. You have to comply. You have to arrest Mr. Taylor. But we did have political support around the world. And, uh, and we were able to, to begin a campaign that led to unanimous resolutions in the, in the, uh, um, um, in the uh, European Parliament and to a 424 uh, to 1 vote in the, in the U.S. House uh, demanding that, that Nigeria uh, bring, uh, bring Charles Taylor uh, to Liberia where he could be transferred to, to justice. And through those kind of efforts and through the isolation of those individuals that have committed these crimes and by making sort of even contact with them uh, inappropriate uh, except for the most essential reasons, uh, we were able to, uh, to bring individuals to, to justice uh, just basically through, uh, through the demands of, 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 all, uh, of all the world. The, um, of course, there will be situations, uh, as, as I've noted earlier, where we don't have an international court and we don't have the will at, at the national level uh, to do very much about it. Uh, what can we do then? How can we start this process? How can we at least get a head start uh, on, on the business of accountability? Uh, I found uh, in, in my job now, um, whereas for a long time I was involved a lot with existing courts, I now travel last year 222 days dealing with situations uh, uh, all over the world uh, where these kinds of crimes have existed and where there's, because they happened before 2002 or they're outside the ICC, uh, there's no prospect for, uh, uh, for, uh, for an international case uh, anytime uh, or anytime in the near future. Uh, one of the approaches that we've taken is to, to press for for, for commissions of, of inquiry at the Human Rights Council, which we got for Cote d'Ivoire and, and, and for Syria, that, that establish at least the facts and, and, and begin uh, the process of, of investigation. In other situations, we've been able to prevail on the countries themselves, uh, even when there wasn't necessarily a, a majority in the Human Rights Council, uh, to accept international participation in, in inquiry commissions, which we did in Guinea. Uh, after the stadium killings when more than 100 people were murdered in the stadium and women were raped on the stands in September of 2009 or in Kyrgyzstan where there were 500 people killed, largely Uzbek in June of 2010 and uh, where almost a half a million people were displaced uh, uh, or, in, uh, or in Bahrain, a situation much less serious in terms of loss of life but still uh, challenging and horrendous with uh, dozens killed 
we had uh, international we had commissions of inquiry established with international presence that went ahead and found facts uh, that then demanded that the that the that the justice systems within those countries uh, uh, proceed on it and, and in each case they did and uh, beyond simply that kind of approach there are other ideas that are out there uh, uh, one idea uh, this is to uh, to take uh, take it beyond the commission of, of inquiry stage to uh, to create a uh, a situation where you literally collect the evidence according to a criminal law standard, uh, build cases uh, through, through uh, international cooperation that, that essentially send the message to those that are committing these kinds of, uh, of crimes uh, that if they uh, don't punish those that are directly responsible, they themselves could be held culpable, that uh, send the message to others not to follow illegal orders, send the general message leave the field, don't participate in these kinds of crimes. Uh, and if you do, the world can be forgiving. But if you don't, we will, we will chase you to the end of your life. You'll be like Non Che at 85 or John Demian uh, until, the light, until the day you draw your last breath, the world will not forget. The uh, British Foreign Secretary recently, uh, and they've taken the initiative on this in the case of Syria, They've asked that, uh, they've said that we must help uh, ensure that the atrocities in Syria are uh, documented according to an international evidentiary standard suitable for local and international courts and have called for the establishment of a Syria-wide human rights abuse documentation hub uh, to collect and collate the mounting evidence of atrocities in the interests of justice and that of the, of the Syrian people. A system of criminal justice is is, is always a work in progress. We know that in our own country, where it's not always effective, where it hasn't always been fair, and all of us have to work each day uh, to improve it. The challenge is much greater at the international level. This is a young project. As we all know, it, it began at Nuremberg, though it was interrupted uh, then during the years of the Cold War. But I'm always inspired by the words of, of, of our uh, American chief prosecutor, Robert Jackson, who spoke of a, of a, of a criminal justice system co who could reach those, reach men of great power, those who possess themselves of that great power and who used it to set in motion evils which left no home in the world untouched. We're be beginning again in the 1990s uh, to, to build on that progress toward a system that will hold the perpetrators of, of mass atrocities accountable, toward a system that will ensure justice for the victims of these crimes once they're done and deter them and protect others from these crimes in the future. A lot remains to be done to make this effective. It's a job for all of us to bring forward that day. Thank you very much. Absolutely. I am a 1L at Case Western. Great. My name is Kenan Castell Foder. My mm -hmm. question to you is through the lens of international criminal justice, what remedies exist now or can be improved upon in the future for bringing to justice egregious crimes committed by Security Council members who hold a veto, such as Russia in Chechnya or China in uh, Tibet or with the Uyghurs or the United States in Guantanamo? Well, that's uh, obviously at the core of, of, of the sort of issue that I discussed here. Uh, and, and, and let me first of all make plain that uh, uh, consistent with the principles of the ICC and uh, it's, it's the obligation of, of, of every state to, to prosecute their own and when these crimes are committed to, to take them on and as we see now in the, in the newspapers regarding the beginning of the case against Sergeant Bales for the alleged killing of 16 people in Afghanistan as we saw with the, the leaders of the striker battalion who were 
uh, of the group in the Stryker Battalion who, was, uh, who were engaged in killing civilians in Afghanistan in the past. Uh, the United States does have a system when, when, when crimes are committed, uh, war crimes, uh, of, of holding people to account. And uh, uh, it's one of the more effective in the world. Indeed, uh, the, uh, Bill Lietzow, who is, uh, was, had a career in the Marine uh, uh, JAG Corps and is now the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense, uh, was active in the Rome Conference and, and thereafter and was actually a, a major author of, of uh, Article 8 of the ICC statute and then of the elements of crime that were adopted by, by the ICC. I think to a large extent a reflection of the fact that it's the Americans that have had the greatest uh, uh, sort of experience and have developed the most complete system uh, in, in, in this area. Uh, but of course, you know, you know, obviously you point to, to crimes uh, committed uh, uh, by other countries which, in which there haven't been many examples of, uh, of, of people being brought to justice uh, in, in those countries. And as I think as I indicated earlier, uh, you know, there are other routes. Uh, there is the Human Rights Council for Commissions of, of Inquiry. That's challenging, but it doesn't have a veto. Uh, we're moving this week on Sri Lanka, uh, an ally of China uh, that successfully in 2009 blocked action by the Human Rights Council. I think there's an excellent chance on Thursday that we'll pass a, a resolution by a majority in the Human Rights Council that. Uh, calls further action on accountability involving the, the estimated 40,000 civilians killed during the, the last days of the, of the conflict with, uh, with the LTTE. Uh, accountability certainly for surviving leaders of the LTTE, but also uh, independent investigations for, uh, for government forces that committed, uh, committed crimes. And uh, that's uh, something in which you know, China and Russia as members of the Human Rights Council will oppose. Uh, but uh, because of the support of countries in Africa and elsewhere, I think that resolution can pass. Now, will that lead to prosecution? Well, it will lead to uh, uh, a greater sort of international uh, pressure uh, uh, on Sri Lanka to, to do the right thing on a national level and to the possibility that, that in terms of engagement with Sri Lanka on trade or aid or other kinds of collaboration, uh, uh, that won't be as easy um, if, if they don't do the right thing. Obviously, a more formidable task when you deal with, 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 with superpowers. But, uh, but even then, uh, it's a matter of, of doing what you can to document these things, to get the information out there. I mean, people are, are full of talk of double standards. And I think part of the talk of double standards actually indicates that standards are being established, that uh, there's kind of an expectation, you know, if you say, it's being done here, why not here? Uh, and that question's being put time and time again. And, uh, and the dangers of, of leaders that were involved in those kinds of things in terms of their, their hope for a future when they might be able to, to, to visit Europe or somewhere and, uh, and uh, vacation, uh, when they might uh, dream of an exile someplace, uh, that might be foreclosed. And so I, I think that developing these, this evidence, uh, putting it forward, making sure that it's there, uh, listening and, and, uh, and, and doing it to a high standard, I think, is, is the approach uh, uh, to take. And eventually, even with the, with the greatest power, I think it, it results, given the global community we have, in, uh, in action beyond, uh, beyond the expectations of the real politicians. Other questions? Yes. Somebody's got to ask the Henry King question, so uh, <laughs> I will. Um, late last year, there was an article in The uh, Economist on uh, the ICC entitled Cozy Club or Sword of Righteousness. When I first read the article, I thought, gosh, they're being a bit critical. But as I read it again, I realized that the article uh, did a number of probably uh, correct things. It, it pointed out the extent of the challenge, which is enormous. It also pointed out some of the shortcomings in the development of the ICC, uh, which, as, when you think about it, are entirely predictable and understandable. It also pointed out uh, a lot of the successes that have been had. But overall, I was sort of reminded that uh, this is perhaps 
a little analogous to the Wild West and the search for justice and the rule of law in the Wild West in, 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 the, previous, in the 19th century. And the fact that you, if you don't press forward and keep pressing forward, um, it, it, you won't succeed. But there, the rule of law prevailed and the justice system prevailed eventually. It took decades, uh, but it eventually succeeded. Uh, do you think that's the lesson of uh, the International Criminal Court and where it's going at this point in time in a similar fashion? You know, keep pressing, keep moving forward, keep improving, and at the end of the day, we're going to be a much better the world than we are now. And secondly, uh, as a corollary to this question, which is sort of the inevitable thing to add in, um, if the U.S., uh, first of all, do you think there's ever a chance that the U.S. will join the ICC at some point in the you know, reasonably near future? And secondly, if it did, what would be the impact? Okay. Well, uh, thank you very much for the question. I, I like the analogy of the Wild West. I mean, you know, there, you know, but one sheriff, you know, you know, investigating and, 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 and honest judges and juries, et cetera, that weren't intimidated, uh, uh, you know, make, make a difference and, and, and it's catching in a way uh, that, that as one place becomes stable and people can, can live freely and, and build and not have, not have the risk that it's going to be taken away from them or destroyed, uh, uh, other people demand uh, the same thing. And so I do think that uh, there is uh, something uh, to that analogy, albeit that was a question of the exercise of power within a sovereign country that could, in the end, make decisions, could tax itself, could appoint good sheriffs, marshals, et cetera. And, uh, and, and uh, in a world of states, you, you have many places where that's a much more challenging task. And, and trying to, to, uh, to have an international court provide uh, for justice uh, in The Hague when it's very hard for it to be achieved even at the, at the lower level uh, and, and when you don't have you know, adequate police and when you don't have adequate courts and other things within, with, within the countries themselves, doing it just at that level and not also at the other I think is, is one of the difficulties with the ICC and it's one of the reasons why I'm, um, even though the ICC itself says they're not into positive complementarity, which is the business of trying to help countries develop their own systems because they're not an aid agency and indeed they don't have a budget for it. One of the areas that I really want to work with the ICC on is strengthening national justice systems. Not just in the situation where the country itself is proceeding with the whole case, but also like in the DRC when there are cases in the ICC, but there are only going to be a four or five people of a very high level and there's scores of others that are involved in mass killings and mass rapes, et cetera, that need to be prosecuted at the, at the national level. And so uh, if we're going to make the system effective, it can't just be in The Hague. It has to be at the national level. And one of the things, one of the reasons why I want to see a more effective ICC is that if it is a 900-pound gorilla <laughs> that's standing off stage and saying, if you don't do the right thing, if you don't prosecute the people in your country that are, doing the, 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 you know, that are committing these crimes, we'll step in. And would you have, rather have justice in your own courts or, or, or justice 4,000 or 5,000 miles away, uh, people will, you'll have the, uh, the negative complementarity in a sense. You'll have countries that, uh, that in order not to have the case go to the ICC will go ahead and do it themselves. So I, I think there's that part of it that's, that's, that's still missing in the international system. And even to the extent that a lot of us have donor programs involving in rule of law, uh, a lot of these programs aren't really focused, I think, directly enough on, on strengthening the ability of countries to take on uh, uh, atrocity, uh, atrocity crime. Um, I'd like to talk, I mean, I'm glad to have a question at some point about, you know, whether the ICC is too comfortable or any of these courts are too expensive or trials are too long, I'll, I'll, I'll save that for, for another inquiry, but I got the impression that that was part of what they talked about in that economist story. But, but to go then to your, to your next question about the United States, I get this all over the world. And, uh, and of course, my answer is always the United States is very slow uh, to enact uh, international treaties and, and conventions, certainly in the area of, uh, of public law. My, my friend Harold Coe has, has, 
as noted, I think that there are like 32 votes in the Senate that are automatically against any treaty. And so getting to 67 <laughs> means you don't have much room uh, to maneuver. And of course, it does take 67. As, as Harold Coe, who's former dean of Yale Law, now a legal advisor, also notes, to become legal advisor, he had to face a filibuster, which thanks to Senator Luger and a couple of the Republicans, he was able to overcome. And I think he ended up with, with 62 votes in his confirmation. And he said, if, if I'd been a treaty, I'd have been defeated. So you see the, the, the difficulty of, of doing that. And we, we know it took 40 years to ratify the Genocide Convention. We know that Wilson sold the world on the League of Nations and couldn't get it through the Senate. We know that, uh, you know, we read in the Supreme Court decision on the juvenile death penalty that there were only two countries in the world that hadn't ratified the Convention on the Rights of the Child, Somalia and the United States. You know that the Transitional Federal Assembly of Somalia recently ratified the Convention on the Rights of the Child? <laughs> <laughs> so we're alone. On the other hand, I, I was mentioning that to one of your previous award winners, Navi Pile, a couple years ago, and she said to me, but you Americans protect the rights of the child a lot better than a lot of countries that, that have ratified the convention. And, and that goes to the, that was very nice of her to say, uh, that goes to the heart of, of you know, American attitudes. So we have our own constitution, we have our law, we have our systems, we've built it up, we know how it works, et cetera. We can protect these rights our way, we don't need somebody from The Hague or Geneva or someplace else telling us uh, what to do. Uh, a lot of us in this world have seen the benefits of multilateral action of working with other countries and how that can benefit. And, and with an enormous effort and a political campaign, sometimes you can convince people uh, of that and, and, and get, a, get a treaty ratified. But it, it, it takes a real effort and it takes like we had when, when Reagan finally pushed the Genocide Convention, sort of a confluence of political factors that sort of make it, uh, make it look like the right thing to do. And, and we're not there on the IC, on ICC. I think the, um, the question on the ICC, I mean, the, the more substantive question is, why isn't Obama, you know, why aren't we saying, starting this campaign to do it? And, and indeed, at, at this stage, we still want to see how the ICC works, uh, how it chooses its cases. Uh, there is this fear uh, that an international prosecutor would uh, want to, you know, sort of uh, show how tough they were by, by, by prosecuting an American, even if, you know, we came in to save 20,000 people, but 20 people got killed by mistake. They'd say, well, I will prosecute the leader who killed 20,000. We'll prosecute the American, too, just to show even-handedness, you know. So there is that concern. On the other hand, you read the ICC statute, complementarity, do it yourself, we do. Uh, you know, you, you have to have, for the prosecutor to move on his own, it has to be a grave case. The suggestion, if you read Article 8, uh, is that you would have to have a systematic uh, sort of war crime, et cetera, not just a one-off kind of thing. So, uh, you know, we'll see how that whole thing develops over time as cases are picked, as judges decided admissibility standards. It may be that at some point in the future, Americans will feel a whole lot more confident that given what we do, uh, that there really is zero risk for us when we're doing the right thing to, uh, uh, to be prosecuted. But it'll, it'll take some time. Until that day, the approach that we are taking, which is evolutionary from the, Bush the second Bush administration when they allowed the Darfur referral to go forward, uh, which would have you know, sort of changed the policy from that of let's kill this court to this court can be helpful in the world. We basically uh, uh, taken advantage of the fact that the American Service Members Protection Act includes the famous Dodd Amendment that says that it, we are not prohibited from assisting the ICC in a case involving an individual charged with war crimes, crimes against humanity, or, or, or genocide. Of course, that's everybody that's, 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 that's there at the moment. Uh, and so we can assist on a case-by-case -case basis once we've made a determination within our government, which we have in, in, in the case of every case where there are arrest warrants, we've, uh, we've said that we support these cases. And we're working to find ways to help witness protection, information sharing, diplomatic political support, rewards for justice, et cetera. We're gonna find ways to help the court succeed when it's doing the right thing, which it is. And, and I think this will build up a level of sort of confidence uh, over time that'll make becoming closer to the court possible uh, when, when and if uh, the, the, the stars align. But it will be 
a, a very long time, given, given our American political tradition. Yes? Are there constitutional issues with respect to the United States assisting in the enforcement of, you know, t taking the principle that you don't ordinarily assist in the enforcement of criminal laws in other jurisdictions, that's why we have extradition treaties, are there issues that arise out of assisting courts like that from a constitutional standpoint uh, in enforcing their criminal mandate when we are not a member state, for example? Does, does that raise any constitutional issues? Well, I don't, I mean, uh, obviously we've been supporting uh, the, um, and we've got laws that say that we can uh, bring people, uh, we can pay a reward for bringing people to justice in Arusha or The Hague or in, uh, or in Freetown. Uh, in, in courts. Now, of course, we've more directly supported those courts. A couple of them are UN courts, of which I remember another is sort of a, a court agreed to be between the UN and, and, and the country. But I don't think there's a problem with us supporting uh, justice uh, else, elsewhere. Uh, obviously, there can be, we're, we're trying to do things with pirates, for instance, that Michael's quite involved in, uh, with people being picked up by the Carl Vincent, uh, even, even uh, Iranians rescued from pirates that we uh, recently delivered to the Seychelles uh, to be prosecuted in their justice system. And we've had a few pirates prosecuted in New York, but it's rather expensive. We like to get the Kenyans and the, and the Seychelles law and others to, to, do these, uh, to do these cases. So we're, uh, so we're trying to, wherever we can, we're trying to work with others uh, in the interests of justice uh, because we, we share common interests. We, we share common interests in, in, in uh, the, uh, the sea lanes uh, free from pirates. We share a common interest in men, women, and children across this planet not being subject to uh, to mass murder, rape, and, and, uh, and amputation, slavery, and, and uh, everything else. And so uh, I don't see that there's a, a constitutional issue. And indeed, I think our, uh, this is also a, you know, a case of uh, the spending power. I mean, if we get into law school, it's pretty, uh, when Congress goes to work and spends, uh, and it's willing in this situation to say we will spend for reward, that's, uh, that's, that's an area in which uh, congressional power is, I think, pretty clear and, and almost unrestricted. So uh, once, once you've got the people's decision uh, to, to do it. And so uh, I, I think we're, we're all right doing that. And as I say, uh, from, from the left to the right to the center, at least when it comes to cases like Joseph Coney's, uh, everybody in the United States wants to see the scourge of a man who's as killed thousands, enslaved thousands, uh, displaced at last count 465,000 people from their homes, uh, want to see him brought to, brought to justice. I should note this, uh, rewards are popular in America. I mean, we always like reward posters, uh, and this is probably something that fits our culture, but uh, this is a reward for information leading to the arrest and transfer of these individuals. This is not a reward that pays uh, for a dead Coney. It pays for a Joseph Coney. You know, in the dock before the International Criminal Court in The Hague. Other questions? There was the, um, I, I was going to say, in the interest of not looking like a Pollyanna about international justice, that other question that you had, and I think, uh, I'm hopeful uh, that we'll begin to see more efficiencies at the ICC, that uh, uh, these, these trials can be uh, and this whole process can be a very expensive one. And, and it obviously disillusions many that this court now in its ninth year finally has a judgment that it involves uh, one individual on, on essentially one crime of, of, of recruiting uh, child soldiers. Um, and uh, you know, we, I think that uh, a key part of, of, of the difficulty with the ICC has been the other, and, and, and this may sound a little centered from the point of view of my own experience in the ad hoc tribunals, but the ad hoc tribunals took a while to get going. It took a while to sort of manage how to do cases. But if you go to the Yugoslavia tribunal now and you deal with a complex slice like the Lodic case, uh, the prosecutor who originally was charging him based upon acts in 40 uh, municipalities of, of Bosnia, because he needs to contract the case and make it simple, has taken it down to, to 11, pared uh, down the indictment. Uh, 
uh, Judge Ori, who will be presiding, <laughs> is putting everyone on a, on a, on a as, as has happened in other cases, but in this case, even a more restrained clock, an egg timer, basically, that says, prosecutor, you've got 250 hours to, to put on your case, in other words, your witnesses and their direct examination, and we'll, you know, if you get down to 220 hours, <laughs> you've got a lot left, you're in trouble, you know, and so uh, they have, I think, gotten much better at managing situations, which are frankly always complex. These are not having been a national prosecutor, prosecutor in a national system, a bank robbery can be over and done with in, in, in five minutes. You've got events that unfold over the course of years, and in order to understand what a leader is saying and meaning and what people understand him to mean, you've got to understand the political context, you've got to know the, the language, you've got to know the proverbs, you've got to know the culture, and of course every, t every bit of evidence you put on on that has another person standing up and saying, no, that, no it isn't, <laughs> that's not the case, and, and you have to deal with the mass uh, crimes, uh, you have to deal with, uh, with individuals who are themselves very powerful and who are trying to restrain uh, uh, witnesses from, from testifying. You've got loyalties to, uh, to clan, to religion, to ethnicity, to nation, et cetera, which, which complicate uh, uh, these situations. It's, uh, it is like Dr. Johnson and the dog that walked on his hind legs. It's not that he does it well, it's that he can do it at all. It's the miracle, you know, et cetera. And so, uh, but, the, but the ICTY has shown you can do it. And uh, uh, one of the good things I think of the six last judges that were just elected, uh, four or five of them have experience in the, in, in the previous tribunals. And even though the procedures are different, in large part in order to keep the prosecutor from going overboard, he has to do lots of things, has to, uh, lots of stops to the judges that didn't exist at the other courts. Uh, it's, it's, it's a system that uh, I think can uh, uh, gain from, from, from the experience of what's happened at the ad hoc tribunals. And, and I look for it to be able to produce judgments about large cases and high-level individuals uh, much faster uh, in, in the future uh, because of, of the experience of what's happened at the other courts. Terms of significance. Well, obviously, I mean, each of the, uh, to the extent, that, and this is what I was talking about in the Syrian context, and as with uh, Foreign Secretary Haig spoke of specifically, which is to, to get it done, to get it organized, to get the stuff uh, to a large extent in the bank at the time that it's happening. Uh, of course, whoever comes in will have to look at it again, and, they, and there may be holes in it, but. Uh, but it's, it's always best to get it as contemporaneously as possible. And, and sometimes there are windows of opportunity that appear early that, that aren't available late. And so I think uh, the world figuring out ways to get out ahead of it is, uh, makes sense, particularly when you have these uh, uh, incidents of notorious mass atrocity like we do in Syria today. Right. Well, unfortunately, yeah, okay. we're out of time. Oh. We could go on and on, I'm sure. Everybody's just really excited by your conversation and talk. Um, but we're going to have to end this here. There are buses waiting downstairs for the students. Can I ask everybody to once again congratulate and thank the best of you. Thank you very much.